Hi. It's good to see everyone. Renee here. Just waiting for folks to show up. Show out. It is Wednesday, October 21st. And my name is Renee Hess. I am the founder and executive director of the Black Girl Hockey Club. But you knew that already. That's why you're here. Hey, Ashley. <laughs> Good to see you. Uh, today, I'm very, very excited. We have a very special guest with us uh, who's going to be joining us in just a second. Sid, I see you. Uh, I'm going to let you on in a second, but I'm going to do a couple uh, housekeeping things, a couple announcements, and... Um, just just uh, update folks on things. So on Saturday, Black Girl Hockey Club hosted a virtual event, the Get Uncomfortable Virtual Event. Thank you so much to everyone who showed up. Uh, we had some really amazing conversations. Uh, this event was not recorded because we wanted it to be a, a private, personal um, conversation between you know me and a hundred of my closest friends. Uh, we had breakout groups that focused on hockey players and parents, uh, hockey fans, and hockey executives, leaders in hockey, people who work in hockey and hockey media. Uh, I know that uh, we had some really interesting points brought up in all of the rooms. We did breakout rooms. It was really cool. Uh, and uh, thank you so much to Mike Watson of the Columbus Ice Hockey Club, Soraya Tinker of the Metropolitan Riveters, and Hoan Tashom from Seattle Kraken, who came in and uh, helped moderate those conversations, uh, just talking about being, you know, black and working in hockey. It was, it was such a great conversation. Um, and so thank you so much for everyone who showed up. If you missed it, we are going to be hopefully holding a town hall type meeting, kind of still figuring out logistics on that um, in about a month. So mid-November next month, if you have signed the Get Uncomfortable Pledge, we will make sure to share that information with you. Uh, hi, Marvel. I see my bestie. She just popped up here to support black women. Love you, girl. Um, yeah, so hey, Catherine. We're going to, we're going to be uh, hosting a town hall event. We'll give you some more information uh, as the dates get closer. We're just kind of trying to, you know, keep, things locked down and uh, get that campaign viral, right? Uh, if you have signed the Get Uncomfortable Pledge, please post a picture to your social media. You can have the hashtag in, in your you know account info. You just do stuff to get the word out there. We want um, you know hockey players, teams, coaches, execs, media folk. Uh, we want everyone to get involved. Uh, Jazz, I see you're on here. Jazz Miley, I'm so excited that you're here. Um, and thanks for the lip color compliment. <laughs> it was a last minute pick. Um, <laughs> so anyways, uh, get that Get Uncomfortable campaign viral. It's We want folks to see it. We want the NHL to see it. We want USA Hockey to see it. We want Hockey Canada to see it. We want your youth leagues to see it. We want people to be having these uncomfortable conversations, these important conversations that will help equity in hockey. That's all we want. We want equity in hockey for BIPOC folks, for LGBTQ folks, for um, non-white folks. So we're going to get started. We're going to have this conversation uh, with Sid Kinder um, and talk about some of the cool stuff that she's doing with the HPOC movement. Um, I also, before we get started with Sid, I wanted to remind you that Black Girl Hockey Club is starting a book club. I know. I got, I got big dreams. What can I say? And I'm a big nerd. I love to read. So I want to give book recs because that's kind of my thing. Um, we will be uh, announcing our book, our first book, and our first meeting in the upcoming weeks. If you haven't already, go to the link in our bio, sign up to be part of the BGHC book club. It's going to be dope. We're going to be having some cool conversations, as we always do, and led by some really amazing young women uh, who are working with Black Girl Hockey Club to, to get the word out there. So that's going to be fun. If you haven't already, sign up. Link in our bio uh, is dope. All right. Yeah. And I'm not going to tell you what we're reading yet. Um, that's, we're, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. But we have some good books set aside because like I said, 
huge nerd. Anyways, okay, so what was I saying? Oh yeah, let's get Sydney on here. Sydney, are you ready? Let's do this. Good y'all. I'm excited. Hi. Hello, hello. Are we matching? I think so. I think, did we plan this? Yes. <laughs> you know I had to pull it out of my closet. It's too comfy to not wear it all the time. I mean, got to support my, the homies, right? <laughs> I'm like, good to see you soon. Hey, yeah, um, it's good. It's good to be here. It's good to be chatting with you and just like talking to everyone about what we're doing. I, uh, it's a great conversation and I'm ready to like dive on in it. It's an important conversation. And what you guys are doing at HPOC Movement is, I mean, it's really amazing. I've been a huge fan of you guys ever since you kicked off uh, about a year ago, right? Mm -hmm. when, did, when did, well, first of all, Tell us about yourself a little bit. What do, what do you do, Sid? How are you connected to hockey? Uh, so I grew up playing the sport. I played all the way up until college. Um, sorry, that's my dog. Uh, I, I played all the way up into college. I coached for a little bit. And then, um, yeah, I've always been in the community and always giving back to the community. And since hockey gave me so many outlets and opportunities, it was only fitting that I try and do my best to give back to the sport that gave me everything. Um, though my time participating as a player and a coach ended soon, <laughs> I found my role and I found my path as an athletic trainer. And so um, I'm currently serving as an athletic training trainer with Auburn's Auburn University softball team. So that's what I'm doing currently. And yeah, hopefully I'll be an athletic trainer to uh, a pro team to anyone who's um, listening. <laughs> Anybody interested? Sydney is, uh, she's happy to help and she's available. Give her a call. Exactly. Yes. I mean, that's awesome. And that's so cool to know that you were, you did some coaching and now tell us what you're doing with HPOC movement. What is HPOC movement? Um, HPOC movement essentially is a, a mentorship type program. Um, it's as discussed and as it's known, um, there's, there's recruitment, but there's not a lot of retention when it comes down to BIPOC people within the sport. And part of that stems from, I personally believe a lack of, uh, lack of mentorship. You don't see a lot of likeness. So you feel very alone. I can't tell you how many times I was the only person of color on the ice, let alone, like at the tournament, you know, and um, Jasmine has, or Jasmine's my best friend. We grew up playing, uh, we were playing travel on the same sport. And though we were states away playing in different leagues, different divisions, we still ended up texting each other every other weekend, every month, like this racially charged incident happened to me on the ice. This happened yeah. to me at practice. Who am I supposed to talk to? My team doesn't understand, you know? And we found just an air of, solidarity and just talking to each other so uh our movement serves to just be a mentorship be a beacon for people be that outlet that resource that people need families need players need parents need to help navigate a world that truly has no path for us so it's just you know you we provide a mentorship service where hey, do you want to talk to us weekly about what's going on? Do you want to talk to us monthly about what's going on? Where are you lost? Where do you need advice? Like what leagues, what travel teams, what's, what just, what dynamic of hockey is so off-putting at the moment that you don't know how to navigate those waters? And hopefully like we throw out some flotation devices, you know, you figure it out and you're able to swim. Like we want all people to be able to swim and thrive in this environment rather than feel like they're sinking and they're just dead in the water because Hockey shouldn't be a sport for that. Hockey should be cultivating. Hockey should be inclusive. And if you're having these people just feel like pylons at the end of the day, then who's truly playing a game? So what are some of the consistent issues that you run into with your mentees? Um, as they grow up, there's just not more of them. You know, so as they go through the program, they're having so much fun and it's great playing hockey while they're young. And then 
kind of around their like teenage years, their formative years, it's just like, okay, like I, I think this is kind of racist. Like I, I'm not quite sure how to like, I know I felt a way, but I'm not sure if I'm, if my feelings are valid and the feelings are always valid. And it's just like, now you're coming yourself. And since everyone's having those formative years, everyone's kind of latent racism now shows a bit more. It's, it's been a bit more challenging with our teen with our, with our more teenage clients, just because teenage years already suck. And now it sucks more because you're now noticing your skin color. You're now noticing who you are yeah. in this sport. And you thought you knew your identity because who truly knows that I didn't know I was a black woman playing hockey until like I hit high school, you know, that's when it apparently mattered, you know? So you think, you know, your identity cause you don't know it. And then all of a sudden this negative wave of who you think you're supposed to be comes and you're just like, well, this kind of sucks. If this is, if, if the notion is you see me as a player with an asterisk and that asterisk is now a double whammy of black and woman, then ouch, like, I thought I was just yeah. a male player, you know? So that's where the biggest challenge has been. And so you have how many mentors in your program right now? I think we're sitting at about 12 mentors in our program. Uh, yeah, oh. either nine or 12 mentors in our program. And it just, I, I don't want to say we're worldwide, but I'm saying world worldwide because our founder, Jasmine, is all the way in Finland. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. So tell us a little bit about Jazz Miley. So I know she, she's here somewhere in the chat. I saw her name scroll by. Where you have to be careful. Jazz right now. Yeah, uh, seriously. Say nice things. Uh, what can I say about Jazz that's already something she already knows <laughs> without, without tooting her own horn? Um, uh, Jazz saw... Jazz saw a well-needed hole that needed plugging in a boat. Mm -hmm. You know, like we're, again, I, I, I don't know why, but I keep going down to this ocean boat swimming metaphor, right? And That's all right. there was a leak in the boat and Jazz saw it. And um, unfortunately, I, I hinted at it before, like we've had the, these encounters in our playing, in our time playing, especially mm -hmm. at the collegiate level. And we found solidarity within each other. And um, I feel like, and Jasmine can correct me when I'm wrong when I'm off this live, but I feel like her experiences were just brutal and ugly for no reason. And the, I don't want to say no reason because the reasoning behind it comes off as more racist than it needs to be. But her, her experiences were not that great. And in talking to her about it, like, this was just something that had to be done. It was more like a call to service, a call to act that she put this together. And I am more than 100% happy to be on board and happy to keep going because in finding solidarity with her, I understood more like it's, it's not about us. It sucks for us right now. And we're hoping that because it sucks for us, it's just that much easier for someone else behind us. And that's the whole point of all of it. And I can only continue to tip my hat off to Jasmine about starting this, about being how strong as she has been throughout all this, even though it hasn't been easy. But at the same time, if she asked me this in person, I'd be like, oh, yeah, you're all right. You know, I just got to keep her humble. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, she heard all of that. So she's probably going to hold it over your head. I know. And for it's, a little it's on live, too. Exactly. Too. Yeah. I can't deny it. <laughs> you can't. There's like 20 whole people here, and we all heard it. Yeah. So that's me. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome, though. I mean, and so where's Jazz now? Finland. And what's she doing in Finland? She's playing pro hockey. I don't ask me to pronounce the team's name because I can't. <laughs> I'm, not I'm, I'm not gonna do it to yeah. myself. <laughs> but yeah. that's amazing. Mm -hmm. So you guys really are international. I mean, she counts, she and counts. she's overseas, yeah. and and that's that's pretty cool. So you have twelve menti mentors. How many of your mentors are of color? All of them. Can you say that again? All of them. <laughs> all of them. Each all of them. Person. And so, 
each of the 12 mentors are mentors of color, black women, men, uh, various uh, folks of color. Mm -hmm. And how many mentees do you have in the program? How mm -hmm. many kids? I want to say maybe right now it's like one per mentor. So I believe we have 12 yeah. and like they, they, um, so how, how it works is kind of like they subscribe. So it's how much you need us mm -hmm. and how much like we can be as hands on or how, how much hands off you need us to be. So I think at the moment we all each have one that we're working with. So it's kind of wow. nice. It's like a like, big brother, that big sister amazing. program. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's incredibly necessary to have representation, first of all, and to have every single mentor in your program be a person of color, that that's huge for the kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, earlier, wait, what, I don't know, today's Wednesday, <laughs> last week, mm -hmm. I was talking to a woman who coaches hockey up in Canada. Mm -hmm. And she asked me, you know, if I had any advice on how to, uh, how she could help her players of color. Um, when they, you know, when one popped up into the, into her team, how could she be more understanding and just, you know, a better listener and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, actually, let me tell you about HPOC movement, mm -hmm. because these are, you know, black hockey players who have been through it, and who are there to help the kids go through it too because and not just the kids though because we talked about the parents mm -hmm. needing help navigating through the system tell us a little bit about that what is, what have you seen with the parents um and their needs for for your program um just kind of i don't want to say overall confusion because as you matriculate through hockey it's not just you're playing oh i'm just playing at the squirt level you have like double a triple a all this all this alphabet soup of things to do. So it's more so confusion of like, where should I be looking? Who should I be talking to? What should I look out for or things I should avoid? You know, like where, what would be the best environment suited for my child? And obviously that differs state to state, country to country in Jasmine's case, but it, it's so hard to be so specific to you. It's, it's like you're going back in history. You got to read the receipts. You got to get the car facts and you got to see like what programs have been accommodating to like what programs have like stood up, spoken up, what programs have other persons, people of color gone through that are like, oh yeah, it wasn't too bad. Like I enjoyed my experience there. I didn't feel like an asterisk. I just felt like a player. So it's been a lot of, in the times that we've spoken to parents, it's been a lot of, okay, like, you you kind of have to do your homework. We help you do your homework because I just think of I had I had the privilege or I have the privilege of having um, a white dad. And I say the privilege of having a white dad, because then as he's taking me to these rinks, as he's taking me to these tournaments and such there, that there's conversations I then don't need to have or my mom rather doesn't need to have or this the undertones of judgment that comes with the conversations yeah. of hey, my child wants to play here. My daughter wants to play here. And it's rather just like he, it's an unspoken privilege that he has and it's a privilege that he used that helped me get into circle, certain circles that I need. So I totally understand what comes down to parents of color and other parents who have like single parent households who it, it, if it is the Caucasian parent that, hey, like what's it truly like the dynamic of when they first see that kid come on the ice? And that that's where it's, that's where the confusion and like, testing the waters comes into play yeah and so you're helping the parents kind of navigate through that and you know on saturday this last saturday black girl hockey club hosted a virtual event mm -hmm. and we had breakout groups one of the groups was hockey players and parents and that was something that the leader of that group mike watson he works with columbus ice hockey club uh he said that that's something that is an incredible very useful and needed with parents of color mm -hmm. is kind of figuring out how to navigate through the system because you know a lot of times uh, black kids or BIPOC kids they hop into hockey because they love it and their parents are like ah, I don't know you know <laughs> yeah I have no idea what you know what important what mm -hmm. they can skip what you know, how much things cost yeah uh, you know going through that 
it's it's hard. So it's really cool to hear that you guys take that on too. Um, in addition to you know just being there for the kid, because you were talking about um, you know having racially charged things happening mm-hmm. on the ice, and how you know the the kids are like, is that was that racially motivated? Yes. I'm not sure. Am and, I mad? And it's am I mad? Yeah. Am I hurt? Yeah. Am I scared? You know, um, stuff like that. It and it's important to have those feelings validated, and to you know to have someone of color mm-hmm. who has experienced that, who can spot out those microaggressions. It's really important because you know otherwise it can just get swept under the rug. Um, ignored or, you know, the other, you know, turn the other cheek Mm -hmm. type of mentality. And while, you know, um, that's just not acceptable anymore. We need to have advocates Mm -hmm. for our kids um, who are coming up in youth hockey, because like you said, uh, getting them excited about the sport is one thing because hockey is dope. It's fun to watch. It's fun to play. You know, it's cool. It's all those things. But as a player of color comes up in the system, you you find it hard to retain them, you yeah. know, and retention is, is key if we want to, you know, increase BIPOC players in the professional level, let alone, you know, their interest in youth hockey. Mm-hmm. And so I find it really interesting that you guys are working on so many different levels. It's really inspiring to see what y'all are doing. And so my next question is how how much, how much do these things cost the the parents and and the kids? So um, I'm pulling up the cost now because I don't want to give anyone the wrong, I don't want to give anyone the wrong price. Uh, It kind of just depends on what you want. Um, I'm still looking. I had it here and I just got to get nervous. I know it can go something between what's it, price listed above or monthly. So a basic plan is zero for a mentorship plan. We do take like donations. Um, it's, I think when we first started off, we we're just like, all right, $25, 20 bucks, something really small in terms of just getting your foot in the door. You have someone there that will be there at call, whatever you need. And I think as we progress, like since hockey is so expensive, the mentorship, the amount of it has decreased as well. So I think we're currently um, currently at zero, as I look on the email. <laughs> currently at zero. Wow. So, so you guys don't charge for just a basic mentorship, just to talk to a kid yeah. once a week or something. You don't even charge. You're just like, I'm there. Mm-hmm. So we have like a Q&A forum. We have like a brother system forum. We have um, like a, a mentorship wow. plan and it's all mm-hmm. free. And, um, in, in it being free, like all, also our mentors are like, we, we don't get anything out of this other than seeing how great someone can work through the program. So I know, um, it's, it's tough work, but it's work that needs to be done. Cause if at the end of the day, if you just talking to me like 30 minutes out of a day, once a week is making the difference between you staying in hockey or you leaving hockey, then that's priceless. That's, that's incredibly Im- immeasurable you know like I can't put a I can't put a number on seeing a kid smile you know I can't put a number on another kid just staying another week in hockey staying another season in hockey so mm-hmm. that's that's what we've decided to do and you know one thing that I've, re- I've realized over the years of participating in Black Girl Hockey Club is even prof- at the professional level that the players say, you know, that they've never had a community, yeah. you know, of, of black folks that support them in hockey, just because it's, it seemed as if there were no black people in hockey. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you, you having this, this organization that not only, you know, um, is doing great things, but also is just, you know, being that support system that, previously didn't exist I mean I'm thinking of the professional you know the men the women who I've talked to over the years that just say you know they like you said I was the only one Mm -hmm. on my team or in my league and just I can't even imagine what the difference would have been if they would have had you know a mentorship program like this 
So you guys do this for free. Yep. You don't get any, you don't get paid for it. Nope. You're doing this out of the kindness of your heart and with your own time and energy and effort, right? Mm -hmm. So how can people support you financially? Do you have a donation link that I can share with people? We do have a uh, PayPal and um, all donations and like everything when it comes down to our fundraise and stuff goes through our PayPal. And it's a pay okay. it's paypal.me slash HPOC movement. So very easy to remember if anyone else didn't write it down when I just said it, but <laughs> PayPal. And if you didn't write it down, it's actually in the link in the Black Girl Hockey Club bio. So if you're on social media and you go to, in well, you're on Instagram, obviously, right now, everyone. Exactly. But you go to Twitter or Instagram, you can go to the link in our bio. The third one down says HPOC Movement, and you can donate to their organization. And when people donate, where does the money go? So we have certain events going on at different times. Currently, um, do specify when you do donate that this is donation, that this isn't saved for you participating in the fundraiser that we have going on. But essentially, all the money that we collect goes to helping a kid, just helping them out, either paying for their equipment, paying for tournament fees, paying for ice time, paying for new gear, like anything, paying for like enrollment on a team. Like we just try to collect and make it that much easier for someone else. So all the money that we do get just gets put right back into the community, right back into the kids that we serve. And it's not just oh like my God. the 12 that we have. It's just like everyone who's in this pool, everyone who tries to donate, everyone who shows their involvement to HPOC are more than eligible to be the one that gets new gear. It gets a couple new sticks and sticks aren't expensive. You know, like I don't think people realize this skates, hella expensive, especially with those growing yeah. feet. You're like a five, one summer, the next summer you're a seven that's an extra 300 bucks. Like people, like we, we donate, we fundraise or we fundraise and we try to recruit and we try to get all these donations simply so we can give it back to the kids that need it. That's amazing, Sydney. Like, wow. <laughs> so well, everything that you get, you give back to the community. You're giving back to your mentees and to others. Just basically who ask? I mean, is that what they have to do? They reach out to you and they're like, hey, I need help with this financially and, and you'll see what you can do? Essentially, there's like an application process. There's like a, what are you doing in your community? You know, there's a, what, what are your needs? You know, how can we best fit them? How, how is HPOC aligned with the needs that you need? And we do try and pick those who are actively in the HPOC community, those who are trying to get out there or just having some limitations and we just help when we can. I remember there was a um, girl, I, I'm blanking on her name now, but she was out in North Carolina, South Carolina, one of the Car Carolinas, and we helped pay for like her tournament fees. I'm blanking on the name, so I feel like such a dunce, but like, it, it's just like small things like that. Like there's an application process. We hear your story. We hear what's going on. And if a given year we have seven to 10 people applying, then honestly, we do try to help each of those seven to 10 in whatever capacity that we can. And if we do a one big giveaway, then out of the seven to 10, maybe two or three get, get the most of it or get the bulk of it. That's amazing. I mean, th that's, that's innovative because uh, oftentimes, you know, it's hard to figure out where to, as a parent, to find funds, you know, to get to get grants, to get scholarships, to get any sort of financial help, uh, it's it's so necessary mm -hmm. for some families just to keep going. Yeah. And it's you know as much as folks don't like to talk about money and you know they don't want to think about that part of it, um, the financial burden of hockey is one of the main reasons why BIPOC folks aren't participating in hockey. Yep. Uh, and so, you know, we're trying to find ways to get BIPOC kids interested in hockey, but you're trying to get them to stay mm -hmm. in hockey. And it, that is, that's amazing. Like I know for me, um, and I can only speak to my experience, but hockey was made af affordable for me through ice hockey in Harlem, which is a non-for-profit and, mm -hmm being a part of that program, like I didn't have to, or I shouldn't say I, my parents <laughs> didn't have to pay much. Like every summer there is a, they would have like 
I don't want to say hand-me-downs, but people would donate gear and like it's a ton of gear and we get to sift through what does or doesn't fit us, you know? And so say out of the 10 pieces of equipment that I need, I found eight. That lessens my cost drastically for what my parents have to now buy me for that season. And people think it's just the equipment that's expensive. It's like, no, ice time is expensive. Like playing on a team is expensive. Like going into high school and playing for a travel team and realizing like, oh, I'm low key paying tuition to be on a travel team. That's pricey, you know? And then it's not just the travel, then it's the tournaments and then it's the private yeah. practice and then it's the summer camps. So, uh, it, it as a parent, I'm just, I'm overwhelmed as a parent. <laughs> exactly. I have one kid, he played a, a sport in high school mm -hmm. very casually. And I was shocked at all the little fees that would come in. And this was with school, mm -hmm. not even outside on a, you know, an out, outside of the school league. And I know hockey is, I mean, it is like one of the most expensive yes. sports to play. Yes. I remember the first and it's not just gear. Go for it. No, no, it's just, and like you said, it's not just gear. It's, oh, it's all everything. those little, everything. I remember the first couple of times, like my dad said, oh, you can go pay for stick and puck. And I was like, I don't want, I don't want to do that. <laughs> like, it's like 30 bucks for stick and puck in the city in some places, just because, you know, ice is so limited. And if you have an indoor rink, oh my god they just it's such a niche market that it's just like oh yeah we can the demand is high so the price mm -hmm. is high you know and it's just I just remember thinking oh I don't want to spend my allowance on stick and puck let alone have my <laughs> have my dad pay like tuition and doing whatever I need to do like, it was it's it's tough no. I don't people do not realize how expensive hockey is and it's not even just like the initial of it it's it's all of it like just sticking it's with money. it it's it's incredible how much money you spend in hot i can only thank my parents because i know i gave them a hard time i came with a hard time and a price tag like that is steep <laughs> they need their retribution after me oh well, my goodness in your defense all kids are basically that so a hard time and a price tag i like that i'm gonna tell that to my kids let, let her know let her know <laughs> So, so what's, what's next for HPOC movement? What do you guys have planned in the next year, six months or so? I know COVID has kind of changed the landscape of hockey for a, like everybody. Um, but what do you guys got going on? Uh, currently we have a raffle going on. It's kind of like a Christmas time. It's going on now so that you guys get your, like, you know how parents, you know, try to get the gifts early. So we're trying to like do the mm -hmm. raffle now. Um, we are working on retiring Willie O'Ree's jersey number. So that's been something on the forefront. Um, we, yes. are, we have also been talking, and again, because it's COVID, we're just not unsure. We want to put together kind of like a little tournament or a little league of just HPOC. Kind of like, just how fun would it be to just have a tournament just full of likeness? How fun would it be to have a tournament full of your peers that when you step yeah. into the rink, you don't feel that weird atmosphere of you, like no one looks at you when you walk in. It's just like, ah, oh, I'm here, you know? So we've been talking about putting that together, but COVID, so we'll see how that goes. Yeah. So that'd be so much fun to have. You, oh my goodness. We're let trying. Let us know. We are trying. You, when you have that in the works, because I I know about, you know, 18,000 followers <laughs> on Twitter who would be very interested in participating in something like that it'd be so much fun like what is it right i'm just thinking like i'm i might get teary-eyed just like oh my god all these like little bipoc kids just skating around no judgment living carefree like that black girl honestly. black boy magic oh my god yes so honestly here's hoping, just here's hoping man because I, I couldn't tell you like after a year like this to get everyone on the ice just like have some fun, you know, just it'd be, every, yeah. the community needs it. The community we want, needs it. We want to make that happen. And we want to make that happen. Let's do it. I, I, tell me what, what can I do to help? Because I, I want to see that happen. Cause girl, let me tell you the first time we ever had a black girl hockey club meetup and we all came together. We went to see the Washington Capitals. Mm -hmm. I flew from California to DC. We had 45, people at this event and it was black women their kids their you know their husbands family members whatever i mean i 
I have never felt so cool rolling into a hockey game right. with 45 BIPOC folks just hanging out, having mm -hmm. a good time. I mean, it's really like nothing I've ever experienced, you yeah. know, and, and that's why I love doing the in-person Black Girl Hockey Club meetups. You know, we had, we, we had our last one in Columbus. I think it was March 1st. Mm -hmm. So literally like right before everything kind of shut down and it was small. We had like 10 or 12 people there, but it's just so powerful to have that community. And I yep. think you guys are building that up um, and letting these kids know that not just HPOC movement, but things like ice hockey in Harlem, the Columbus ice hockey club, mm -hmm. black girl hockey club, that these things exist yep. for the kids. I think it's going to make all the difference. It truly does. Know? Cause like it's, it can be so isolating when you're in it. Cause when you're in it, you don't see what's around you. You just see your immediate yeah. circle and your immediate circle looks nothing like you. And it's not a singular event. It's not a singular feeling. It's not just known to me. It's not just known to Jasmine. It's everywhere. And if you can just see outside your circle, like see beyond the horizon that there are so many kids out there that look just like me, that look just like Jasmine, that look like just like every other BIPOC hockey player out there, then they'll see like they're not alone and there's so much solidarity and just coming together. Like, I can't tell you how much fun it's going to be if we get this going and when we get this going. Because I just know, because <laughs> like I didn't have this as a kid and I could tell you like, with ice hockey in Harlem, like, every time I went to the rink, like, once, twice a week, I never noticed being a black kid playing hockey because everyone on the ice is a black kid playing hockey. And it was only until I started playing travel, and I was like, wow, where'd y'all go? You know? Yeah. And, like, so I, I want that feeling back. And it's slightly selfish because I want that feeling, but everyone who's played hockey, I mean, everyone wants that feeling. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You can't tell me you don't, yeah. you know? It's contagious. No, I mean – the whole I, I I often tell people that the whole reason I started Black Girl Hockey Club because I wanted to hang out with Black women and see a hockey game. Like yeah. that was a selfish reason. I I wanted that community, and as I move forward, I realized that I wasn't the only one who needed mm -hmm. that community. You know that there's there's thousands. You yeah. know, of hockey fans out there, BIPOC folks who love the game of hockey, who just want to be part of the community. Yeah, and I I'm. I'm so impressed by what HPSC movement is doing. I'm so impressed by you, Sid. Um, you have single-handedly been pushing this uh, retire 22 jersey, um, mm -hmm. this initiative forward for uh, Mr. Willie O'Ree. Yep. Uh, I know yesterday or maybe the day before yesterday, you posted the video of me um, talking about the retire 22 campaign tell us a little bit before we go um because we already went over our half hour time but you know how we get we, get, <laughs> we just hey, chat. We keep talking just chat. So, tell me a bit about the retired 22 initiative what are you trying to do there and how can people help um honestly i i don't want to say it goes without saying like the more eyes on it the more that people talk about it the more that people share about it the more that people sign the petition and kind of just knock on the doors of those who are influencers in the community to gain their attention just helps it grow more. Um, I remember, so the Willie documentary came out in 2018 in the year he was inducted to the Hall of Fame as a builder. And I remember sitting with my father during the screening and he, he was brought to tears. And he was brought to tears simply for the fact that he finally understood how hard it was for me as a kid. And like, yeah. it's not that... I didn't have it nearly as ugly as Mr. O'Ree had it. However, it wasn't pretty either. And it took like my own dad, who's been to the rinks with me, who's never missed a game, who's never missed a practice. It took him hearing Willie's story and seeing other people of color and other players of color and their involvement in their story and how it all relates back to him for him to realize like, excuse my French, but this shit ain't easy. And it's not fun as a no. kid to grow up and be isolated. And to this day like even now every BIPOC player I can think of who's playing gives their credit to Willie and Willie is the advocate now Willie people like to argue that his stats aren't there or that 
you know, he wasn't in the league too long, but his impact knows no bounds. His impact is still going at 85 years young. And he just wrote a book. He just he wrote, just wrote a, a book. book. He just wrote a book and published a book. Like, ma'am. <laughs> is he doing the most? Oh, my God. Like, black boy magic. Like, I just, oh, I like, love it. you can't, you cannot sit here. No one could sit here and argue with me that this man does not, is, not, is not deserving of all of his flowers. And all of his yes. flowers include the retirement of his jersey. Because it's, um, it's great seeing people play with 22 on. Many people don't realize what that number means, who wore that number, and what barriers that number broke. Put that yeah. number up in the rafters of every arena, and now you have a conversation piece. Now you have understanding. Now you have solidarity within that community that, like, hey, Dad, like, I see 99, Gretzky. Everyone knows Gretzky, but who's 22? Mm -hmm. 22 is Mr. Willie O'Ree, kiddo. Like, he broke those barriers. Like, you're at this game. You're enjoying hockey, right? You see Evander Kane. You see Matt Dumba. You see P.K. Subin. You see all your players of color on the ice. Willie did that. Because. Like, yeah, like he paved the way for all of us to skate on. And it's it's almost one criminal that Hall of Fame took so long because let's get with the program. And two, NHL, mm -hmm. I need you to speed it up too because if you want to support diversity, if you want to show inclusivity, if you want to support the BIPOC players and the BIPOC admin members that are within your organization, recognize those who did it first because it's not easy. It's so incredibly hard to be the first one to do it. It's so incredibly hard to be swept under the table and the rug and to bite your tongue and turn the other cheek that when it comes down to it, you have, you, when the opportunity is there and the opportunity has been there, when the opportunity yeah. is there, you need to say full heartedly and with so much grace, thank you. Cause you have, yes. a, you have a community now that the NHL did not have before, right? You have, you have players and youth and just again worldwide attraction to it. You have mm -hmm. a team. You have a hockey team out in Nigeria. Like, come on, right? Like, <laughs> if twenty two is not hung up before like the twenty the twenty one twenty two season start, something is wrong. Like, I need this yeah. man to have his flowers, and I need him to get his flowers while he's still here. Like, I'm not waiting twenty five years after his death. Like, baseball did Jackie Robinson. I love Jackie Robinson. Mm -hmm. Not discrediting him at all. But Willie mm -hmm. needs to know and understand and see how much people appreciate him while he's here and while he can cherish it. Because post hot, uh, I can't say that word, but after death, <laughs> after death, it's so hard to give someone their flowers because it's just like you're realizing how great he was afterwards. Like everything's good until mm -hmm. it's gone. It's good now. I need you to appreciate that it's good now and tell him now. Retire 22. That's my spiel. <laughs> Bam! My job. <laughs> You know what? On that note, girl, thank you so much for joining us. I'm seriously like, please, everyone who's watching, go check out HPOC Movement. You can follow them on Instagram and on Twitter. Tell us how to find you on social media. Okay, you can find HPOC Movement at HPOC Movement on Instagram, on Twitter. You can find me at Sid Kinder on Instagram and Twitter. You can find ja Jasmine has too many handles, but at Jasmine yeah, J. Yeah. <laughs> but like we are out there and HPOC movement has all of our contact information. You can see us out there. You can reach out to us whenever you need. And we are more than here, more than happy to answer questions and more than happy to provide any mentoring that you may need. Oh my gosh. I, I really hope that you get an influx of students <laughs> and, and mentors who reach out to you because you're seriously doing such important work and it's such an opportunity for BIPOC kids and not just BIPOC kids, but also, you know, non-Black kids yeah. who can use that, you know, mentorship as a way to understand the world mm -hmm. a little bit better. How to be a better and ally. I, Exactly. Yeah. And, and to be an ally. And I just think it's really amazing what you guys are doing. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having um, me. I told you I wasn't going to be bad. I know, it's but amazing. like, I'm, you don't know this because I'm not showing my armpits, but I'm sweating right now. Like talking, <laughs> talking gets me a little hot. I forgot to turn the AC on. <laughs> and the, and the hair is down. <laughs>
Yeah, get your hair out your face. Go have a glass of water. And and you know what? Just thank you so much for talking with us, Sid. Have a great afternoon. We'll talk again soon, okay? And awesome. whenever that, you know, BIPOC hockey tournament happens, we're, we're doing it. We're yes. making it happen. First contact. For you sure. know it. Yes. Makes me excited. All right, girl. I'll talk to you later. See ya. Bye. Y'all, Sydney, she's so great. Oh my goodness. Some of that stuff I didn't even know. Um, mentorship, all three. I just, they don't make any money off of this. They're just doing it for the love of the kids. And the fact that they are giving, you know, away uh, gear and paying for, tur I mean, wow, that's amazing. Uh, please go follow them on social media. Donate. Give some money. Throw some money at them. They're doing great work. Uh, thanks, everyone, who watched this. I'm going to definitely try to save this and make sure that this is uh, available in our IGTV Get Uncomfortable IG Live series. Um, what a great conversation. I'm inspired. I hope you are, too. Uh, you can't get any more of these cool T-shirts, but go check out their website. They do have some really cool stuff over there. All right, y'all. Have a wonderful Wednesday. Um, take care of yourself. Uh, it's my birthday this weekend, so I am trying to get everything done so that I don't have to uh, look at any emails between Friday and Monday. So um, if you're going to send me one, I don't want to read it. All right. I'm going to end this now. Have a great Wednesday.